Jamie. Go. Hi, everybody. Everybody that's going to be watching this replay that is because uh, <laughs> no one is on yet. But we are going to start inviting some people and letting them know what the dealio is. What is going on? Good evening. Good evening. How's everyone doing? Even though I'm talking to myself. What's going on, Film Star? Thanks for joining. Hey, hey, Duke. How are you? You getting ready to have a conversation here shortly. And please let us know that you can hear us because we are always trying new mic yeah, setups. So do sure. let me know if we if we're good. Have any issues today? I don't think we're just using the one mic. using the one mic it is going to be this is robert's week so i might just be sitting back i say that all the time when i say that but i, I don't even know how to just sit back and not mm -mm. not be <laughs> it's all good though <laughs> figure it out <coughs> we will figure it out i'm about sending out so people know what is up that we out here in these streets we are out here yes we are yes 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 we are how was your week duke if you're still on how was your week how did things go all that good stuff let us know what's up we want to know what's going on in people's lives mm -hmm. we do we do we do we do i'll just be sending some time so they might be like, what is wrong with you? But we got to let the people know that we're up. <laughs> do you, hey, do you? And they're twice, huh? Yeah, what's going on here? That's what's up. We appreciate it. <laughs> sure. Everybody come in twice. Yeah, help us out. Exactly. Get them numbers up. We need our numbers up. We know we're doing good work. We just need them numbers up. Let people know about us. Let them know what's going on. Hey, good. You can hear me. How was your week? Let's see. And they haven't stopped me yet, so I'm just going to keep going. Once I just feel this done. We are just going to wait a few moments. We jumped on early so we could get people in here. Mm -hmm. Did y'all hear that Amazon is raising their prime prices? Why not? Yeah, they're raising their subscription price by $20 um, yearly. And if it's monthly, it's increasing by $2. So hmm. Amazon is not playing. They yeah. their money. Is they got the world by a stranglehold. They might as well. You think they have a monopoly on what they do? Mm, I wouldn't call it a monopoly, but um, they don't have any competitors. Mm. Did you know that um, Amazon? Well, except for what's that? The Chinese one? Wish? No, it's, a, it's, it's it's I forget the name of it. It's a Chinese version of Amazon, basically. Oh, I've never heard of it. Yeah. And yes, really, Duke, they are. It just was announced that they're. If you pay your yearly subscription, and it might just be the U.S. because they they did quote the U.S. prices, which is twelve ninety nine a month, and they're raising it to fourteen ninety nine. We'd have to see what the Canadian prices. I'm assuming they're probably going to do it all around, um, and it makes sense because I will give it to Amazon Prime. They get you what they need to get you like right on time. Alibaba. Alibaba. There we go. That I thought I didn't think that was uh, Asian. I thought it was South Asian. I thought it was Indian. That is Chinese. Interesting. You know, but Alibaba doesn't everything. have the same level of infrastructure they do. I know I've ordered stuff off Alibaba and it, it is not Amazon terms. Like it is no. a whole different thing. But if you're in China, you ain't ordering Amazon. You're ordering Alibaba. Like, oh, so you meant like in that part of the world because the way you said it, I assume that you were talking about it's their competition in terms. So then they're not direct competition. No, it's there. But it's only equivalent globally that I can think of at least. Yeah, so has nothing to do with anything though. Amazon well we're just we say Amazon is doing its thing and again good for them if people are having infrastructure problems and somehow Amazon has figured out 
how to deliver things, then it's it's all good. Like that makes sense. We are going to give it a couple of minutes. Also, there was this interesting thing, and I had a whole hissy fit about it. Um, and it was on Baller Alert, and you start seeing which of these websites are run by women or run by men based on the comments. So uh, I don't know if people will be able to see this, but there's this. And if you can look at this, this is a, a tire of a car and it's basically balding. Um, and the caption said, ladies, if you're single and your tires look like this, you need to answer one of them dudes in your inbox back. Then what happened was the person who runs Baller Alert, which I clearly later found out, um, was a woman said, nope, we can afford tires, buy." And as I looked in the comment section, it was just, this was, was supposed to be such a funny situation, turned into some very angry, bitter women who were just coming like, oh, and men can't do it either. And one woman was like, well, I'll just get the, the tires and call my brother. Why do you think your brother wants to do it? Why do you think your brother's woman wants him every time you need something that your brother's going to go help instead of just saying, you know what? We we can find a man and then another son. These men don't know what to do anyways. It was just this whole kit and caboodle. So I went in there and I had to say something. If I can find mine, I said, damn, this comment section is full of sadness. Starting with the caption, how can single mothers raising black boys teach them to love themselves when they don't even love the men that help them produce them? What was supposed to be a joke showed just how bitter this new generation of women are. Men take note of these women and don't answer when they call for shit. These women are all independent until they need one of y'all no good men for something. Shout out to the women in the comments who recognize the value of a man, a black man. So I had to put my two cents in because it just became such an angry, vile thing. And it was meant to be a joke. And all of these women took it seriously. Again, including the person who wrote the caption, which again started it. If you already set the tone, I think people start doing it. And then I just had to kind of put baller alert on, on a timeout right now because I was just like, I don't like that. And they've done that a couple of times where it's like the caption just kind of like, oh, like why did you, because you, the whole idea of these sites to me are to evoke conversation. But if you've already done it where it's such a biased conversation, like, hey, ladies, what do you think? Hey, guys, what do you think? And then go from there. But it was like, oh, we can do it by. It was just angry. Anyways. Yeah. Um, I'm ranting, but a lot I of just... that going on these days. Um, that's why we're, you know, kind of that's why the title of today's show is Perfectly Imperfect. You know, kind of a spinoff of last week's show where we were talking about, a lot, you know, kind of the, the different statuses. You know, you have single, you have available, you have taken. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a lot of revelations around those, those different statuses for for lack of a better way to put it me and she were like conversating and talking after conversing the show. conversing I hate that conversating word. yeah con conversing <laughs> after the show and one of the things that i came up with um and that's what i wanted to kind of discuss is i think one of the biggest most important foundations of a relationship is being cool with yourself being okay with yourself, loving yourself. I agree. And I don't think I that's like as common things. as people would like to think it is. So I wanted to try to set the stage around the conversation of how can you ever have a successful relationship with another person if you can barely get along with yourself? And again, I think there's plenty of folk that, that can fall into those type of situations because of the fact that you never lose company. You know what I mean? Hmm. But. And is it that or is it this idea of, you remember Jerry Maguire and that scene, like it's that very famous scene oh, you where he says, me. you complete me. And I think, for, I, I remember watching that. And I'm like, this is such a joke. How were like two half people make a whole how does that work you need two whole people in a relationship to make it work however women love that it was like oh my god this man who complete me and look and it was this romanticized idea of i can come in with all of my flaws but if i find a man who accepts them then he will complete me 
Yeah. And then the other side of that is, and I'm probably not going to want to accept any of that man's flaws either. Probably not. That's, that's, <laughs> that's where Well, that's, that's the part that's that we going. have to discuss, That's right? where perfectly imperfect kind of comes from is everybody wants to be accepted, loved for themselves. But then the judgment starts. You know what I mean? So how can you on one hand say, I want you to accept me good, bad, and ugly. Mm -hmm. But then in the scope of that relationship, that's not what you give your partner necessarily. What your partner gets is more of um, as long as you're meeting certain, meeting the standard, then we're good. But the minute you fall below that, then we have a problem and the relationship's in jeopardy. But whose fault is that? Is it both the parties? I, I think it's why do you say it's both parties? I think it's both parties because it always takes two to tango. And while you have the person who was sitting there wanting to be accepted, the minute that it feels like that street isn't two way, mm -hmm. it's probably the time to start stepping back from the relationship a little bit. But we like to try to change people in relationships too. I, I no, I've never been that person. I've always been the person is I'm not going to make you a priority when you treat me like an option, right? That and a, that, the the issue is a lot of people, men and women, go into situations where they make that other person their priority, and the behavior of that other person shows that they're treating them like an option. I think it. I think that the onus is on the person who's feeling like they're an option to leave. Yeah. If it's if if you are in a situation where you are giving someone all you have to give, and that's the important part, it isn't your all; it's all you have to give. So there, like you always say to me, there's a difference between a man who's got ten thousand in the bank giving his woman five hundred dollars, than the man who's got a hundred dollars in the bank giving his woman fifty dollars. Right? A big difference. Is a huge difference in that. So again. If someone that you've seen that when you look at that person, you say that person is giving me all they have and you are not uh, feeling as if, you know what, I'm getting the same in return. I don't think it's the person who's taking you for granted to decide to stop taking you for granted. I think if you're feeling taken for granted, get the fuck out. Well, that comes back to the other important facet of relationships is that something I learned clearly from pretty much every relationship I've ever had, good or bad, up or down, left or right. A person can only treat you how you allow them to. Amen. Simple as that. A person can't cuss you out unless you sit there and allow them to cuss you out. If you get up and walk out the door, they just, they got to chase after you. They got to, now they in the crazy space. You know what I'm saying? But when you sit there and accept less than what you believe you deserve, that's on you. And so the, here's, here's the question though, who determines what someone deserves? You Be, do. Okay. But what about people who are delusional about what they, uh, they deserve? I can't even focus on that, man. Like you talking about people on champagne with beer money? Pretty much. Yeah. That doesn't really work out. Um, it, it, that, I don't even know if we could really focus on that. Cause again, it is a big segment of the population that it's believed it's just kind of um, I have a very nominal existence and I want someone with an exceptional existence. Amen. That doesn't line up. Amen. Because while it's a great benefit for you getting with that person with the exceptional existence, that person with the exceptional existence is just getting, just getting someone anything. that they got to pull up to their level basically. And look, I, look, people from all different walks of life can find common ground in many, in all different kind of places, but that's got to be communicated. Well, let's talk about if we're again, our the, the idea of the show is to change the conversation around black relationships. What we're encouraging people to do is have conversations. And I think only by having real, let me actually do this, having real in depth Ooh conversations before you commit yourself to someone do you have you 
had conversations about the things that are important for you to have long-term success in a relationship. That's one. Number two, do you know what's important for you to have long-term success in a relationship? And to me, if you're broken and you're coming in trying to think someone can fix you, well, you're already coming in with a handicap in a relationship. And you're putting a lot of burden on the other person that they're probably not going to be very appreciative of. And that's, that's just what it is. Um, if you were holding you down before you got in a relationship, Amen. why wouldn't you hold yourself down in that relationship? That is facts. And you actually gain the benefit of incorporating another individual into the fold to help with the entire movement for lack of a better word but when you are not holding yourself down and you're looking for a relationship what do you think you're looking for in that relationship that is a good question you're probably looking for somebody to hold you down so Sorrel and Sage says some people don't know how to have those conversations because they don't know actually know what's important well, then do not get into a relationship. No, man. I'm... Not not if you want long-term success. And again, our the idea behind this show is for people to have long-term successful relationships. Sorrel and Sage also Ooh, that's add, a great point. or sometimes they want to kill the vibe by being all serious right off the top. I can agree with that. I think a lot of people want to just go with the flow initially. Okay. But that's how you wind up in a place you're not familiar with. When you put a boat in the water, do you just let it go with the flow? No. Because you're just you got up to navigate it. You'll wind up wherever the hell yeah. the current takes yeah. you. So by the same experience, and I've learned that I'm definitely a lot more serious coming into the situation from, I'm just not playing about certain stuff no more. I said there are certain things that I just refuse to go through anymore. There are certain things I refuse to tolerate. And there are certain things that I just said, if it becomes to that, then it's time for me to, to do something different. And But we also navigated our dating part, whatever we want to call what happened between us. Like we navigated it because we asked the questions and we got into the serious situations. And again, if we were dating with intention, and I think maybe it's because both of us have also been married before. Um, yours lasted a lot longer than mine, but we've both been married before and we knew coming into this the second time around what we wanted, what we didn't want it. And it was really what we did not want. And so we were kind of right off the bat going in saying, okay, well, this is what I'm looking for. And this is what I also have to offer. And you know what I'm saying? Like it was, it was very much like that. Um, so I was in stage, but said, but then they just end up in situationships. Mm -hmm. And can you and and can you be mad because if you're not, if you're coming into something not having the conversations necessary to have long term success, and that's in anything. And when we talk about changing the conversation in, in relationships, we're talking about not just romantic relationships. We're talking all relationships in our community because again, relationships benefit creating black families and better black communities. So on stage just also say sometimes a refusal to discuss the serious things also reveals a fear of commitment or fear of getting hurt. Ooh, talk about that one, yeah. honey. Or or partially I think both of those are valid, very valid. But I also think that that refusal to discuss serious things, we see that in our political system right now. It's a lack of maturity also. I, I think that when you hit a certain level of maturity in your adult life, you like, I'm not playing about certain stuff. I ain't got time for certain stuff. I don't have patience for certain stuff. I'm not dealing with certain stuff. And I believe that is because of maturity. Mm -hmm. You've been through some stuff. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But when you have, when you don't have that, when you don't have the that maturity, when you do want to kind of keep it cordial and easygoing and chill, then that's exactly what you're going to wind up getting a very surface level relationship, but not much depth to it because you can't really get to the nuts and bolts, the stuff that really will drive people apart until you start digging into the, until you put your hands in the depth there. You know what I mean? You've got to roll your sleeves up and figure out it is because again, we, we, we play that game of then what, then what, mm -hmm, then what, then mm -hmm, what, then mm -hmm, what, all mm -hmm, the time. Mm -hmm. And what we usually find in that is 
the the more we then what the more we kind of find ourselves staying on the same course when you just how, how am i trying to phrase this when you don't have that sh- strategic viewpoint towards your relationship things just happen well is that also because people and we this was one of our topics People are depending on the love and affection for their partner and not the practical part of being in a relationship together. As much as Rob and I love each other, we have a practicality about our relationship. Like, you know, today marks the one year anniversary of me, of me packing up my ass and getting all the way here to be with him. And when we look at the trajectory of our relationship and where we started one year ago to now, it it's crazy for us what has happened. I mean, we feel like we've also packed five years into one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's been one. But when we look at, you know, baby, have you ever really thought about it? Because I was thinking about it today as I was just kind of like, my God, it's only been a year. But again, where we, you know, when you pick me up from the airport to where we are now to where we're going, wow. Um, think about that. But here's some, these are some yeah, good comments. Um, Duke is saying, you'll make better decisions when you've been through some stuff such as being married already, at that point you have a more clear idea, clear idea of what you want in a relationship. Our sponsor, Sorrel and Sage says, you have to ask the hard questions and the uncomfortable questions because you want to get to know the person and you want to make sure that you know what you're getting yourself into, which leads me to one of my poll questions. And this is, again, guys, we generally, when I put the poll questions up, Rob and I actually don't really discuss them in our answers. So I'm going to ask him and then I'm going to reveal what, all of you had to say. Sure. Would you ever lie to your significant other to avoid hurting their feelings? I don't like the idea of that. So no. No, you say that, but again, I think I also in it's semantics, but absolutes like never and always and things like that. I don't really like using those. Oh God, please with the semantics. Just give me a yes or a no. So no, but thank you. He is so on semantics. I cannot, I said, would you ever not never, but the same, ever is the same thing. It's just, it's, it's, Oh my God. This is, this is my life with him. Everything is semantics. I just wanted a yes or no. That's all I wanted. So his answer is no. My answer is also no. I do not lie. I do not lie. So, but 69% of people said yes. And 31% people, 31% of people said no. So 69% of people Good question. I'm going to just go right to Duke on that with, and again, people, that's, that's unfortunate. You know what I'm saying? Because before we get to um, Duke, I do want to get into naturally fears. So naturally fair says you will never know fully what you're getting yourself into because people change and situations change. Um, Duke's question, that. which Rob is going to talk about right now, at what point in the relationship do you ask the hard questions? So you make that say ask. Uh, once you've determined it's a relationship, <laughs> at the point that you have determined I want to be with you and you want to be with me, at that point, y'all need to take it serious because the only way to get the outcome in that relationship that you want is to be proactive about where you're going. My answer is actually slightly different. I think it's before you get into the relationship. I think it's once you have determined that this is a person you could see yourself being in a relationship with, then you ask the hard questions. I think sometimes we get into the relationship Mm -hmm. and that's when you get comfortable in the feelings and the ushy gushy and then pum pum meets vagina meat dick and all of the lovely glowing feelings that go with that. You know, we ask the hard questions like, like almost right up in the beginning, if we think about it. I mean, again, our courting period was very short, but we were in there with hard hitting questions. The last thing that we wanted to do is get into something and go, oops, shit, I forgot to do this, but now you, you're in an entanglement, okay? Because all feelings and, 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 and all of these things have happened. Come on. So, so let's say you think it's funny. Of course, uh, Rob's answer is no. You guys have a show called Fuck Your Feeling for Heaven's Sake. Laugh out loud. Yeah. Ah, Duke Nation's got a great question for Sorrel and Sage. I love this audience interaction. What do you consider a hard question, Sorrel and Sage? I think, let me, I'm going to answer before Sorrel and Sage um, think. 
I think people need to be talking about what are their views about how someone runs their household? What are their views about finances? What are their views about gender roles or rules, depending on how people want to look at it? What do they think about traditionalism in a relationship? Do they want a more modern relationship? How would it look if the woman made more money? How does it look if the man wants the woman to stay at home? How do you want to raise the children when you're blending families? What does that look like? How big of a role does the person who's coming into that family have with raising the kids? Like, what do your finance look like? What are your, what's your bloody credit score? Like, where do you want to see yourself five years from now? What does that look like? What are you willing to do to get there? Like, you know, it's, it's funny. I used to, when I was in the dating world and I would go on these dates and it was this, these awkward, almost like interview style of like, so what's your favorite color? And like, and, and I'd be like, oh my God, like, what do you do for fun? I'm like, wake up. Like I wake up and that's fun. Waking up is the best <laughs> and the funnest thing I, because I hated it. I wanted to know about someone's childhood. How were you raised? How were you exposed to love? Um, what, like, how did your family grow you up? Like, I know that in it some people think it, because it is, you're choosing someone to spend your life with. Thank you, Patchy. All that is my new Tinder profile. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, what you guys got me thinking right now is that maybe the questions aren't hard, but it's the answers that are. Ooh, no, the answers are hard. Because you're going to lie to ask a question, but you'll see people lying to answer them. Because we mission of truth, finessing it, not being honest with yourself. You start getting into all of that. We all want the other person to see us in the best light possible. And when we start sometimes thinking about the things that we have been through, it can be difficult to verbalize that because we want to paint the rosiest picture of ourselves. What Rob and I did, our picture was not rosy. No, we did the opposite. Like that's what our I picture kinda, was, I was not just say, rosy. I don't think we did that. I think we did the opposite. That's kind of my mo always is that I'm gonna come with the rough stuff first. You know what I'm saying? Because again, you walk in, oh, he's tall, he's this, he's that. He's that. No, I don't. Oh yeah, yeah, you did. Yeah, you handful. came. You came with I the am whole, a whole I handful. Like, my new book and, to talk about it. And <laughs> I'm gonna let you know that. You know, coming up front is like my titties are not working today. Yeah, sorry, yeah, you, you know, <laughs> sorry yeah, guys. Man, like, like, I'm, I'm really big on it. get into the ugly of it first because that's really what matters more. Look here, the the pretty things. That's why y'all talking. Thank you. The pretty things are the things that um, brought you together in the first part. It's no, the man. package. Right? We all present the package, but when you unwrap the package, what is underneath, right? It's like Rob and I always talk about, people look at a BMW. I'm obsessed with BMWs. My last car before I left Toronto is BMW. I love BMWs. So people can look at a brand new 2022 BMW and go, oh my God, this is amazing. I want it, pack it up. They didn't even look under the engine. They didn't look to see that that damn BMW was fitted with a Kia engine. It ain't the BMW you thought it was, but you don't know that until you open it up, you turn it on, you take it for a drive, you pull up the hood, you look in the trunk, you do all of that. That is what is supposed to be happening when you are getting into a relationship. You are supposed to be pulling up underneath, looking under, kicking the, and kicking the, the whole thing. Home inspections, because you don't want to buy that crib and then realize you got asbestos and mold and stuff all going on up in there. But it was a great looking house. You just, when you pulled up on the curb, you're like, oh, this is amazing. Yeah, you got to look into the, if, if you got basements, if you got attics, every, all of that has to be looked at. And again, in my opinion, I'm, I'm coming straight with the, nah, I'm coming like not so flattering. Because if you can deal with that, then chances are you can deal with me. Well, Princess Lo Shelly Love is saying it. And hey, Shelly, share the worst and will they stay? Exactly. Ooh, girl. Like, give them the option. I don't never want to feel like I tricked nobody into nothing. I just don't like that feeling. And I don't want to feel like I've been tricked into nothing. But he but here's the thing. You know, we, we have sayings like, you know, put your best foot forward. And I think in every aspect, that's what a lot of people attempt to do. When you're going into the job interview and they ask you, you know, what's your weakness? You basically, you've been, if you've been taught, so drink, if you've been taught, you, you turn something that is really a strength and say it's a weakness and see how you're getting over it. Like, you know, no one's going in and say, you know, I really just don't know how to do this job. 
So no one's coming into relationships just saying, I don't know how to do relationships. I like you. I think we could be good together. I think our story at the end of this could be great, but I don't know how to do relationships. Who says that? Not many people. Um, not if they're really And here's all of my crap. And again, this is why, you know, you know, I said in my new book, as much as we come and we sit here and I put myself in a pretty package, we never want to present our relationship as a pretty package. Relationships are hard. This has been hard, but we are committed to the commitment of staying together. And that is why we are doing this, right? Because we want, again, in order to create successful relationship, you actually have to go through the hard stuff first. So Sorrel and Sage is saying some people withhold the worst because they want to make sure that someone's in love with them or feels a certain way about them before they reveal their truth. To Rob's point, it's like being tricked. Dean yeah. said, talk that talk, Rob. No, it's emotional terrorism. That's the term we use for it. That's the term when you get a person, you, you break out your charisma and your, your, your best smile, your best clothes, you're on top of your game all the time. And then you want to come with, here's the other side of it. I, uh, I got a terminal, dis- terminal illness. Or I'm broke. Or I'm broke. But whatever it is, you know, it, whatever it is that you're not really wanting, because you feel that the person is going to judge you for that, that's kind of the stuff you need to be getting to up front. Like, I, I believe fir- firmly, like, kind of one of the big things we talked about early on was politics and religion. Because them shits will jack your relationship up, for real, for real. If you're not in alignment on those things. If I'm a right-wing Republican and she's a left-wing Democrat, we ultimately going to be looking at each other in the house like, I don't even know where you'd be coming from. We also talked about a really um, interesting topic in our community, and it was finances. And the fact that when we started in this relationship, we had the lack of them. It was in the beginning of COVID. We were both going through financial mess. You know, money was leaving my account faster than it was coming in. Quite frankly, it wasn't coming in that much. And we, I, I created a whole spreadsheet and it said, here, here, here is what this is. This is what this looks like. It will not be there forever. Rob did the same, right? And I, and it was so, it was so interesting because again, it, I would you know I put it in my new book. Rob was the best bet I've ever taken because this was a man that when you read and you're going to read his story because Rob's going to be coming up with his his own book soon called No Guidance. Oh. When you read his story and see where Rob has come from, Rob should be dead or in jail. He was born to a 14-year-old mother and a 21-year-old father, and they both had problems in their life where Rob basically was raising himself. And Rob was in a grown man's body by the time he was 12 years old. Real talk. Raising himself. And so from what Rob came from to what Rob is, having played professional basketball, has a bachelor's in economics, has an MBA, has it works in finance, and y'all know in finance, you ain't, you ain't got no felonies. So I already knew that. I knew when he said he works in finance, I was like, hallelujah, you ain't got no felonies, right? But there were things. But when when you hear it, if you just hear Rob's story, you go, damn, really? Never been in prison? Like all of the stuff that he's been through. But again, we talked about that stuff because it was seen through the surface. I needed to understand all of that about him to be able to say, this is what I was dealing with. He heard my story of being, you know, the product of an affair and, and, yeah. and what that looked like for me and the structure and sitting in therapy and having to unpack the fact that I might have abandonment issues because even though I was raised by my stepmother, how being taken from my mother, the impact on that. I never even realized I had abandonment issues. And my therapist was like, what do you think? You were ripped from your like, And I wasn't ripped, but again, I had of the bond that I created with my mother. We were separated. And then I had to deal with the fact that the woman who raised me, I was the product of pain for her. We talked about that. How many people don't? So I know you got to... Yeah, um, see, so Dean made a point that you get to a point and a real woman determines if you're even worth her time. She knows within the first 20 <laughs> minutes when she meets a man, if he's somebody she would sex, date, or friend zone. So no one would want to be that. You know, So that's really important time. And I, I firmly agree with that. And men... We know even sooner, at least the physical yeah, side y'all of it, definitely you know, know what I'm saying? <laughs> we know from across the way, like, okay. And then 
the other things start to open up. But I think women, y'all know really quickly what the vibe is with a guy. You know what I'm saying? And I think it's almost criminal, for lack of a better way of putting it, male or female, when in your head you know you have this person as friend zone, but you're kind of steering them towards like relationship with that with the intentions of what you can gain from the situation. Well, here's the thing. The whole friend zone thing is fucked up. I'm going to say, ladies, right now, stop friend zoning these men. Men get into friend zones because they generally express to you that they're interested. And for whatever reason, you're not ready, you're not interested, not your type, whatever your damn reason is. But you cannot put a man in a friend zone and then expect him to act as if you're in a relationship. So when your tires need to be changed, when you your car breaks down, when you need to change a bloody light bulb, when you need to put together a shelf, don't do that to that man. Because there are not many men who friend zone women. But women, we are out here friend zoning men and doing and doing the most and then getting mad when they get into relationships. Anyways, that I'm on All a right. rant. So, but, you so know. I say hard questions. Do you have a criminal record? Do you have any addictions? How many baby mothers, daddies do you have? Do you have any STIs? Are you a homophobe? I think you have to get sometimes even more specific than that because of people's ability to lie by omission. Semantics, again. Yeah. So like, do you have a criminal record? That's pretty straightforward. Have you been charged with any crimes? Because you can be charged and not right. have a criminal record. That's a, That's a very different it. question because I can say, no, I don't have a criminal record, but I've been charged with crimes and got out of it. So I don't have a record. Do you have any addictions? I would probably spin that into like, what are your vices? Because everybody got vices. You cannot sit here and tell me that there's nothing derogatory that brings you pleasure. Like, stop it. You know what I'm saying? Whether it's a drink. I don't know, she might be about the closest thing to it that I know of, but she still sip on something. And, you know, we, we're going to... Yeah, I'm not a big drinker, it. but... I <laughs> but so it doesn't fall into the category of addictions, maybe. But, yeah, with me, you know, it's... I partake. Let, let's be clear about that. <laughs> Shh, we're um, trying to find your job. How many baby mothers, daddies do you have? Um, and for guys, even, you know, do you got any kids that you don't know about? You know, that's... You got kids you don't claim. You got kids that you don't claim. You got maybe babies. That one? Do you Not, have any STI? Have you ever had an STI? That's very different because some of them, yeah. you, you pop in, you know, I think it's chlamydia. You pop a pill a couple of times or whatever, and it's good to go. So do you have any current STIs is very different than have you ever had an STI? Yeah. And are you a homophobe? Yeah. How do you feel about gay people? Right. Because most people are going to say no. But what if you say to them, how do you feel? How would you feel if you're, you found out that your child was gay or a lesbian or bisexual? Very different question. Because most people are going to want to say no. But when you make it more personal, then you see their true reaction. And then, you know, there's what's your credit like? Is there anyone right now who would be <laughs> upset to know that you are talking to me out on a date with me? That's actually a good question. Very do you claim good question. Anybody? Does anybody Does claim anyone you? claim you? And then what I like what Duke added in is let's be real. No one will ask all those questions right off the bat. I agree, but you should be asking them shits very shortly. You know what I mean? Like, I don't I think, think you should be on date five and those questions haven't been addressed. It's funny that Duke says that because I remember I was saying to Joanne, I was like, I wonder if I should release a book with Robin Eyes message in that 10 day courting period before we were in a relationship. And you guys would be actually surprised to, we did ask some of those, actually a lot of those questions. Um, and I think that's probably what made our relationship happen so quickly because we actually put it all out. I was hearing things about him and his background and what happened and it, emotional breakdowns and things that happened with the mother of his children, things that have happened in his marriage, things that happened in his childhood. You know, I don't want to put all his mama's business, but her vices and what that meant in his life. I mean, you're going to put it in your book, so I don't mean you yeah. want to do that, but you know, I put it also in my book. Um, so you guys have to get the book, but you know, we put that all out there. And there was an affection that we started to feel for each other because we were being so real. And I don't like to use the word authentic because it wasn't, we were being real. Right, because it was good and bad, you know. There's some of those, you might answer it with a disclaimer. It, it, it might be a, a lot of different things. But I think what comes of that is when you're being very upfront, I, I, okay, let me spin it. 
I think one of the best ways to get to know a person is press them on their viewpoints and their perspectives. Because once you start getting enough data points on viewpoints and perspectives, it will start to paint an image of a person's character. Mm. You understand what That's I'm saying? That's what you were doing. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know. And character matters uh, tremendously <laughs> in anything that you're doing, you know. And you don't have to be from the royal family. You don't have to be rich. You don't have. You, you could have grown up very impoverished and still be a person of high character. You know what I'm saying? A person who it just kind of walks and moves in the space of, like, I, I mean what I say. I say what I mean, and I am who I am. And obviously that ain't for everyone. But what you can do with that is you start to eliminate people that ain't for you and you start to identify the people who are for you, you know. Um, and then a second part, I think, that that does paint, kind of tells that story when you're looking at people as far as um, forward moving is what kind of friendships do you got? You know what I'm saying? What kind of relationships do you got with people of the same sex? You know what I'm saying? Like, Toshiba has 20-plus year friendships. So do I. There's a reason for that. You know, people ain't going to be your friend for decades if you flaky, you always lying, you always making up stuff, you always just you just being derogatory. Long-term relationships are developed through consistency of character. Here was the thing. That was actually one of the profound things that Rob said to me that I'd never thought of, but he said, the next relationship I get into, I promised myself I would never be with a woman who didn't have at least a handful of long-term same-sex relationships. Absolutely. If she didn't have friends that she had known for 15, 20, 20, whatever plus years, and we're in our 40s, so at some point, you, 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 you got to have them like 22-year, 25-year, even 30-year friendship. The, you know one of the friends and really the only friends just because I moved here one of the only friends that Rob met of mine is when we were in New York on our first trip and this was my very best friend from Jamaica and we'd known each other since we were five I'm 42 now and so he and then even though we don't talk all the time I hit her up and said girl I'm in New York it happened to be my birthday she came she embraced Rob she brought me a gift and I think Rob looked at that like here it is, you know, 30, I was, I think I turned 41 at the time. So here we were, you know, 36 years, don't talk to each other every day. Sometimes there's years that go by, but the fact that I was just like, I'm in the city, he looked at that. And as I started telling him more about my friend group and, you know, before I even moved here, we had a whole Zoom call of my best friends all on the call, like, Yo, we need to know who you are. We need to know who we're sending our girl off to. We need to know where to find her. And I think, you know, a lot of men would have been like, what the fuck? But he took that as, while my girl has people in her life that genuinely care about her, this is the type of woman I, I want to spend my, my life with. Well, because friendships are not as hard to maintain as romantic relationships. and But mm. they are difficult because life takes you separate ways. You have to maintain them. You have to work on friendships also. You know, they don't just self-maintain. And like you said, years can go by without you talking to a person, but there's that underlying understanding of life got me here, life got you here, but when we get a chance to reconnect, mm -hmm. we're always going to do that. I just caught up with one of my partners from college, you know what I'm saying? Because um, he was in town and we just chopped up. I hadn't seen Mike in like probably three or four years, you know what yeah. I'm saying? But that's one of my friends that we start making, we start drilling on each other as soon as we see each other you know what i'm saying it's like the moment i see that guy it's like no time has passed and and that's a i think that's how it's supposed to be now on the flip side of that and i want everybody to do a little thought experiment in their head for a second think about a bad relationship you had right think about that person that you were in that bad relationship with did they have a lot of long-term friends I'm willing to bet probably not hmm. because it's kind of indicative of that. Hmm. You can't have a long-term relationship. How you going to have a 20-year-old marriage if you ain't got a 20-year friend? You have no experience in maintaining a relationship over tenure. You just hit me in the head with that one. It matters. I remember one thing. Like My, my, my high school coach used to stress to us. Stress to us. Your name is your name. 
And as a black man, that might be the only thing you ever have worth value in your life. Protect it. And again, we go through all kinds of stuff as black men. You know what I mean? And I do think that the the road to success is a little more littered with landmines and stuff like that when you're a black man than it is for mm-hmm. for, for some other, you know, for uh, other races, for lack of a way of putting it. Um, like you said, you know, that I'm not a felon, you know, that, that's one thing. I got a lot of felon friends that that's not, uh, a barrier to friendship for me. Cause I understand by the grace of God, I don't got to check that box. You know, I can't say I've never broken the law. How will we not put that out? <laughs> no, I'm just saying, like, I'm not going to admit to nothing. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to sit out here and, and put a, build a case for myself or like, shit like that. But I'm just saying, and, and more people being honest, man, you know, speeding is breaking the law. So stop, stop, you know, it, it's, that, that's where we get into really, it gets interesting where, you know, um, a violation is a violation of violation. You know, like they say in, 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 in the word, you know, a sin is a sin. You don't rank sins. So Duke uh, has an interesting comment. I had to scroll back up because this is good. He said, there are some people that you meet that you just feel comfortable talking to. But if you, if someone started asking all those questions, Right off the bat, I'd be like, why this woman asked me such so much question? Can I touch on that? Yes, absolutely. Yo, dude, I think what that is, is if that vibe ain't right. She might be interested in you, but if your vibe, if you ain't vibing mm-hmm. on her or vice versa, it's going to come questions. off like an interrogation. <laughs> I'm a big one. I like, Fuck you don't ask questions. me two, three questions in a row because I'm about to say something like, yo, what the fuck? What is this? You know, because again, that starts to feel like a, a, a interview, an interrogation. And it's usually when you're in a place of you don't even understand where all these questions is coming from. Mm-hmm. Like, why are you asking me all this stuff? What are you trying to trap me up in? Or what do you what do you got going on? It seems like all those questions come with an ulterior disingenuous motive. But when that vibe is right, you'll sit there and just bounce them questions back and forth off of each other all night because every answer you feel like you're getting to know that person a little bit better here's a question that sorrel and sage um wrote how do you feel about your family and that was actually something that we had to discuss Mm -hmm. um because thinking about our family structures and the structure that we wanted to create and even though we weren't going to have biological kids together we were going to be clearly in the life of the children that we you know we both have more than me um that was important that was important i had to do the shade um you know that was important how do you feel about your family and how do you feel about family period what does a good family structure look like what does a problematic family structure look like do you have people in your family that you still hold dear and near what is relationship with your father what is the relationship with your mother you know, all of these different things are, are right. And again, how does just, that impact you? Like and that? Al, and how, does, really, that how does that impact, impact how you, you see relationships? Uh, did Sorla say that she's a former gener- journalist? I ask all the questions. <laughs> Agreed, Cass. Family is not always blood. Absolutely not. You know, but family is always family. And those are, you know, you have to make those considerations really in, in how you deal with those people. But, um, no, nah, I, I think, again, that your family is also the one you build along the way, you know. I, I got brothers from another mother, you know, I've got, yeah, th- th- it, those are just, there's, there's different relationships that mean different things to you. And if you're a, the type of person that values relationships, you tend to try to manicure them over time, you know what I mean? Like... I might, like I said, I might not have seen my boy in three, four years, but I, I know it would never get to 10. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, damn, I ain't talked to this guy so, in so long. Or some something will cause that connection to come back up. So this was, again, one of our poll questions. Do you embrace your imperfections? 77% said yes, and 23% said no. And before I get to what Sorrel and Sage um, said, here is the part of embracing your imperfections. It's you are presenting actually the best parts of you funny enough because when like i know who i am and i know who i cannot be in a relationship and i know who i can be in a relationship and i'm 
very upfront about who I cannot be in a relationship and what type of relationships will not work for me because I know who I am. And I know the, if, if you put me in a space where I'm just like, this doesn't work for me as, as hard as I try, I'm just not going to be successful. So I had already understood for me what I could not do in this relationship. And if, if, I, if, if I, he was like, you know, I want you to not pay 50% of the bills, that shit was going to work. Like, and again, for some people it's whatever, but for some men, it's, it's a requirement. I would X those men off the list. I'm not paying 50%, nothing. I'm not paying $5. Okay. So that I already knew we already came to alignment on that. He was like, I'm a man. I, I take care of things and you, you contribute and you make this house a home. And you know, we had talked about the roles and the fact of how that would work. These are things we had to discuss because again, we both knew having been in previous marriages, what would and would not work for us this time around. And so Duke, you're right. Yes. When it's coming from a woman, like Rob said that you ain't feeling any like kind of energy with. Of course, you're not going to answer that shit. But when it's a woman that you're really talking about intention, you're going to answer. Trust yeah, me. You're you going to want to answer to those questions. You're going to want to you're going to want to shed light on on those situations. Well, that's what Sorlin Sage just said. And if I don't ask those questions, it means I don't give two shits about the person in front of me. That's facts. Right. See here. The, and this is where the genesis of the show title perfectly imperfect comes. I believe every person has three sides to them. You got your good side. You've got your bad side. And you got your ugly side. <laughs> the ugly side is exactly that. That's just ain't a whole lot nice about there. Now, in all of those different aspects, there's things that you identify as strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. When you're talking about your good, not really a deal breaker. Even when you're talking about your bad, not really a deal breaker. But, but when ugly. you get to the ugly. I don't know a lot of people who are successful at changing their ugly. It's difficult. Even it's, with therapy. It's it's kind of almost Even your nature. You know, in a lot of cases, your ugly is kind of your nature. Um, you can't really change that. So if you can't change it, you better learn to accept it, deal with it, and love it. Because, look, my stubbornness. I'm okay with it. But if I'm not okay with it, how in the world could she ever be okay with it? It's a double-edged sword. Sometimes it's an issue. Sometimes it keeps us persevering when mm -hmm. a lot of other people would have given up. You take the good with the bad. It, it, it is what it is. So I really look at those ugly things, and you got to look at yourself in the mirror and really be able to be honest with yourself. Like, these are not some of my best qualities. But you have to accept those and, and deal with those and mitigate those and manage those because that's a very big part of who you are going to be able to present forward in the relationship. And that's all on you. So one of my uglies, and I talk about it again, the new book comes out March 29th, Fuck Your Feelings, A Journey to Imperfect Love. I'm a runner. I'm a track star. I was literally a track star. I ran track for many, many years from mm -hmm. literally Jamaica all the way to the, the end of high school. But in relationships, I'm a runner. And I told him that. I, this is not really working for me. I'm good. I'm gone. And that works up to a certain point. But you get to about 30 something. It ain't so attractive anymore for a woman. And one of the things that was important was we made a decision that it was, we get up every day and choose each other. And if we, if we get to the point where we can't choose each other consistently, then we need to have a conversation. But we were also committed to the commitment of our relationship. It wasn't about being necessarily happy all the time because we're not. This isn't, we don't, trust me, there's not butterfly and rainbows flying around this house. We come from two different cultures. We come from very, you know, family backgrounds with, with things that we've seen that we shouldn't have seen. Again, I'm the product of an affair. He's the product of a 14 year old mother. Um, right again, who's had, to, who's had some issues. So we understood that, you know, we didn't necessarily see some of the things that we wanted to have in our relationship. And so it was up to us, but we put that out there. Right. Had we not, how could we combat them when they arose? You couldn't, you know, you, you just can't. So I think, uh, again, that's a, 
a major part of it is if you can't accept you, how do you think you're going to get someone else to? And I don't say it as it's on the other person. What I'm saying is those things about yourself that you don't expect, you know, that you don't accept, trust me, they're going to have, they're going to manifest in that relationship. Mm -hmm. If that's nothing else, it's because like you're, you're looking for the other person to smooth that out a little bit for you. You know what I mean? So I, 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 I'm stubborn. But I'm not okay with stubborn. So when I do stubborn things, I'm looking at Toshiba to be like, oh, no, that's okay. Don't worry about it. No. She's going to get sick and tired of that shit eventually. But here's the thing. This is where I'm going to put on my you know, psychology degree hat. I think a lot of that comes to insecurity. A lot of the times we don't want to accept the ugly and the bad because... It's, 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 it's an insecurity, yep. right? We do not want to accept those things about ourselves because it doesn't paint this pretty picture of what people want to paint, right? And I think, especially in now when we've got social media and the curation of people's life, a lot of people are looking from the outside into other people's life and saying, I want that life and look how pretty that looks. No, it's not. We're all a mess. We're a mess and it's either you're going to accept your pile of shit or you're not. And if you can't accept your pile of shit, don't try to serve it to someone else. And unfortunately, that is what a lot of people are doing when they're trying to get into these relationships and wondering why they're not working. You don't like the smell of your shit, but you want somebody else to appreciate it. Good yeah, luck. I, I remember saying I heard overseas. It was something along the lines of if everybody could put their problems into a pile in the middle of the room and then had the opportunity to go back and grab a problem, chances are you would take yourself, your own problems. When you look at that pile and see all the other stuff in there, <laughs> you'd be like, nah, give me my 14 year old mama. Cause at least I know how to deal with that part. You know what I'm saying? I don't know how to deal with some of these other problems and issues, mm -hmm. you know? So again, you have got, to accept yourself, embrace yourself, and be working on yourself in order to have any successful relationship, even a work relationship, you know what I mean? Because I see it in people sometimes at work. You can't say anything about the quality of their work. So how are you going to get them to get better? Well, I mean, I know someone who just experienced that where they were trying to tell somebody that they needed to elevate and God forbid they didn't like that. And again, in relationships, aren't you supposed to elevate? I think in any relationship, the whole idea of, I think, any, any two people uniting is to consistently get better. I would hope in my friendships that I'm not the same 18-year-old or 5-year-old or 25-year-old when I'm in my 40s. I would hope even after a year of a relationship, people can go, oh my God, look at how we've grown together in our friendship. That is the whole point of the, of a relationship is to consistently grow, is to consistently elevate. But if you can accept the things that are going on with you that might prohibit that growth, because that's the part. Me being a runner, I understood pro would prohibit growth from us. So I owned it, babe, I will run. And you need to be aware of that. But you know what we do? We designed our life in a way that I had nothing to run back to. I mean, that's, that's kind of... It sounds... I laugh at it, and it's not funny, but our life is actually designed in a way that I don't have anything to run back to. And a part of that is just being committed to the commitment. Without being committed <laughs> to the commitment, you'd be holding on to... You know, again, you'd have a, a, a emergency bag packed. You'd have a, a, a little, have, you'd have a couch somewhere planned in. You know, you, you'd have, you know, you, you, you'd have something in place. You'd have an escape plan. And so the state said, and we and will we send, send you, you back. back yeah. No, because no, and, and I love, I'm going to be serious about it. So when, when I was, when I was leaving, one of the interesting thing is I kept getting advice about keeping my condo kept getting that advice girl keep your condo keep your condo 
pay for it for the next few months because you just never know you're gonna go and it might not work and all of that different stuff okay and I said no if I have a place to come back to in the moments it gets rough guess what I'm going to come back because that's me and it's not that I don't have a stick to itiveness however I don't, I, you know, in therapy, I learned, I just like hurt feelings or any type of hurt or these daily heartbreaks that relationships are about. I don't enjoy them. It makes me uncomfortable and I'm out. And so I had to design our relationship in a way that like we, Rob just said, I was committed to the commitment of the relationship. We were going to ride it out until we were exhausted. And if we both put our hands up, like, no, we just can't do it. Let that be it. But I wasn't going to create a safety net for myself. So I can be like, oh, it's been two months. I don't like it. It's hard. I don't like the weather. I don't like what's going on. I don't want to be raising the kids. I don't want to do this. I want to, okay, babe, it's been fun. I'm just going to go. And then we can do this long distance thing. He would have been like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> Not at all. That wouldn't work. And again, I think that that attitude is why society is set up the way that it is and jacked up is that the way that it is, is that the moment of discomfort, the moment of this is not what I thought it was going to be. Most relationships end, you know, or not. No, not end. Fracture. Fracture. And people start hedging bets and stuff like that, you know, so I'm not all in on this relationship, but I'm not leaving it either. And that's so kind of the definition better. of a situation ship where you're not invested in the relationship. You're not invested in leaving it. You're just waiting around for something better to come along. Doing it just to be doing it, I guess. I don't, I don't no, know. No, you're waiting for something yeah. better to come along because and for a lot of people, it's, it's better to be in a bad relationship than in no relationship at all and so they'll just wait until something better comes along and that's why we even talk about this idea of taking a break and you know there was this idea and we this celebrity i'm not even going to mention her name but she was talking about her she's on a break on her relationship and you know her and her person they're gonna work, i guess work on themselves separately and come back and rob like she's capping and Rob the gave my gave his viewpoint as a man, and I was like, "Oh my God, this is amazing!" Tell them, babe, what you said. What you said, babe, about this idea of taking a break and how ridiculous it is for men. Well, because men don't work on relationships we're not in. It's just that simple. <laughs> what the hell is she talking about? If uh, uh, use us as an example, Toshiba says, "Rob, whatever, whatever reason, whatever issue we got going on." <laughs> We need to take some space. I'm going to go back to Toronto for a little while. I'm going to work on me. You work on you. I'm, I'm working on you. <laughs> oh, my God, babe. I'm just saying because men look at it like that. So even if this relationship is something I'm going to go back to, in this little break that we got, is my opportunity to run up some strings. So why wouldn't I do that? That's how I think most men tend to look at it. We were in a relationship. We broke Because if you're not, how do you say, let's take a break, but we're still in something? That part. That doesn't even make sense. Only to women. This idea, and that's when I realized, this idea of taking a break only makes sense to women. Yeah, because like, to, to men, it's like, okay, we're broken. Okay, so we're broken, and wh why would I want to stay in something with you that you clearly think is broken to the point that you need to leave, pack your bags, go and do whatever it is that you want? And when he said that, he's like, men don't work on relationships we're not in. That's ridiculous to men. And this is why, again, we have a show called Fuck Your Feelings. Ladies, men are not operating all in their field. So if you need to find yourself, he's like, good, but understand that I'm going to find someone else. Who doesn't need to clearly find herself? She's already been found. Or, again, or I'll just be, like like Cass said, I can do bad all by myself. Or I can just be by myself and deal with the pros and cons of that. But here's why men don't like that attitude. You took space. Let's We, we need space. So we're going to take a year off. Oh, my God. That's right? Well, whatever it is. Six months, three months, a year, whatever. I think most men look at it as if when you're taking that space, you're looking for something better. And when you don't find something better, then you want to accept 
what you have and feel more comfortable about what you have and feel better about what you have and you want to go back to that, guess what? He ain't feeling you like that no more. Because men don't ever get to do that to women. Men don't ever get to curb a woman and then come back around later and act like she's everything I ever wanted. Because y'all know, like, no, you curbed me from day one. So that's why I say and it just is a rule of thumb, you know, when someone has stepped to you like they want to be with you and you don't, that's kind of from this point on forward because I used to say, like, especially on my basketball career, I'm the worst person to let double back. Let me have tried to holler at you in high school and couldn't get no play and then all of a sudden I'm playing ball overseas and you want to get with me? Guess how that's going to go. Well, Sorla said just met dudes do the same. Princess Shirley loves stuff. Same thing women think when men say that. And Sorla Sage says again, they put their current relationship on pause to test the waters elsewhere. I can men say, say hold that? on. I can, I can say I've personally never been in any situation where a man did that. I will I will 100% say in all of my failed relationships, I was the common denominator because I left. I've never had a man said, let's take a break. I've never had, have I had situations where I have left someone um, for what, and, and again, you'll learn about it in my book, but a lot of the reasons I left um, men was over children. Um, I had a baby at 21, didn't want any more children. And unfortunately my pheromones, which I'm going to bottle up for women and send out my pheromones. Let me just a pause on this. My pheromones do two things. Bring men without children in your life and to bring men over six feet in your life. This one's six, nine, baby daddy's six, seven, ex-husband is six, four. Just saying, ladies, if you want my pheromones, here you go. But anyways, a lot of my relationships had to do with children, not wanting children and the fact that I was never going to produce the children for another man. So if I had exes come back after they've gone out and maybe had a child, the relationship didn't work and wanted to get and blend our families. Yes, but I've never had a man. Who said, let me take a break? You want to read some of those comments? Yeah. Um, so I didn't say, oh, well, Princess Shelley Love says, same thing women think when men say that. And so I say, they put their current relationships on pause to test the water elsewhere. Um, that just seems, I don't know a lot of that. I know guys do stuff like, it's not you, it's, it's me. me. But what that really means is, it's you because, it's me because I don't like you, basically. Um and again, men are horrible. Men don't like to hurt women's feelings. Like that's something, unless we're just being like totally being assholes. Like we just <laughs> don't really like being mean. Like even when a, a, a not attractive woman comes up to us, to us and asks how she looks, we try to be like, you all right? You know, we don't want to be like, oh my God, you know? But when she leaves, we'll turn around to the boys and be like, bro, I can't even believe she asked me that crazy ass <laughs> shit right there. You know what I mean? Like, why would she, ask, she know how she looked. Why would she want to ask me that? Um, that part. So that brings me to um, one of the questions. Um, and I use it present tense and past tense, so I'm going to read it both ways. Is history keeping you in your relationship or has history kept you in your relationship? 36% of people said yes, and 64% of people said no. Has history kept you in a relationship before? I would probably say to a degree, especially like once the extent of like children are involved. That's a big history right there, you know what I mean? And, but I also have learned, this sounds terrible, but fuck them kids, man. Kids is no reason to be in a bad relationship. This is facts. Uh, yeah, I know it sounds so, so bad, but again, to any of our viewers or if this makes a clip or whatever and you're in there talking about y'all trying to do it for the kids, don't. Because you're not they, helping them. You're not helping y'all. You're not helping nothing. Y'all just making a bad situation extend longer and longer and longer. Because trust me, the kids know y'all not vibing. That the part. kids know y'all ain't really feeling each other. That and part. they would prefer y'all going about y'all separate ways that part. and focus maybe on them a little bit. That part. I used to say I would rather my daughter be in two separate happy homes than one miserable one. Right. That was always my thing. And when um, me and her father just were at the point where I was like, this is this is just is not going to work. And yeah, we could we could keep going. But the reality of this is if we're looking out for our daughter, this is actually what's best for her. Because, again, two separate happy homes or one miserable one. I'm just not 
not willing to do that. I also want to say though, it's also incumbent on the people in the relationship to ensure that they're doing what needs to be done in the relationship to keep the relationship together. And this is why we said committed to the commitment of the relationship. Before I continue on, Ooh. um, Prince Charlie Love. It's the comfort zone and the effort and unknown to start over or not to go through the whole effort and cost for divorce. It's easier to stay. Not my situation. Just say. I'm going to add to that. With that. I my think that's a lot of people do though. They, that's, that's their justification of dealing with it. It's the path of least resistance. My father used to have a term and I know probably a lot of men have used it. It's cheaper to keep her. That was his thing when he was unhappy with his second wife and you know, us as the older kids knew it and we, he would say, baby girl, it's, it's cheaper to keep her. Uh, I, I'm not going through all of this with the kids involved and so forth. And again, I'm a runner. So I was like, cut that shit. Fuck that bitch. <laughs> like, get rid of her. But he was like, it's cheaper to keep her. When we start untangling finances, untangling homes, untangling all of that, it just, it's cheaper to keep her. And so he was willing to stay in something that he wasn't happy in um, to just keep this going. I'm sure he cheated though. That's a whole nother story. Yeah, I, was gonna say I mean, I'm the product of an affair. Of course he's a cheater. Too, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> like, it's definitely, it was cheaper to keep her, but it wasn't like he was keeping them options exclusive either. You know, you just added to the roster a little bit. My daddy's a great daddy. He's a flawed man. But I digress. My father has been with his current, with most, uh, with his current, with, mo with for most of my life, and he's been miserable as hell. But here is the thing about our parents and grandparents and great grandparents. The thing we'll give it is they stayed together and it sucks the, the last thing you want to do is stay together and be miserable, but they had a level of stick to that we just do not have. And I think this is the reason, which brings me to my uh, other, me, poll uh, question. other point Go ahead. also is, and again, not to, throw shade or nothing like that but um if you've been in a miserable relationship for 10 years maybe you should stay in that shit because i don't know if anybody wants to be in a relationship with someone coming out of a 10-year miserable ass relationship and it's gonna be like cool you, you know what i'm saying there's no way you've been that's like saying there's no trauma behind that well, there's you know definitely trauma saying? Like, you can't go from relationship to relationship. If you get out of that situation, you definitely have to go to therapy. You're going to have to take to some time. You're going to have to part, to, to, you know to, to figure out and break apart why you decided to stay. What it is about you that made you stay? What was it about the other person? What was making you miserable? What actually makes you happy? How do you define happiness? How do you find happiness? Is happiness is with inside of you? Is happiness with the other person? Like you actually have to go through all of that. And this is why therapy is important. I'm telling you, therapy will keep more relationships together. Find a good therapist, by the way, a very, very good one. You should always test out therapists. If both of you, especially couples therapy, if you're both not comfortable with the therapist, you should not go. I would, I would recommend to women to do different sex therapists, especially black women. Often we're going to go to women, especially white women don't understand her trauma. Black women just going to do the whole black women sit together, protect black women, go to a black male therapist, especially if your issues are with your father, men in your life and so forth, because he's going to see it from a different perspective and open up your eyes in a different way. But he said his wife was my nanny. No oh, girl, man. not his wife was my nanny. Okay. Oh man. I'm just going to go to this phone. <laughs> And ask the next poll question. Can someone else make you happy? Yes, 58% and no, 42%. What would you answer? Can someone else make you happy? Yes or no? I just, I don't want semantics. I yeah, just want I yes know, or it's no. such a semantical question, but I would probably lean towards no. Because if you're in a place that you're miserable, I don't know what level of effort it would take to push you from miserable to happy that's a really big gap there you know what i mean um happiness comes from within exactly so i'm going to answer that and i'm going to slightly disagree so i'm going to say yes someone else can make you happy there are things that you do that absolutely make me happy however my happiness is not your responsibility Okay, that's a good, that's semantics, but I'm like, I'm not semantics. No, it is, it is facts. 
No, but I'm saying, yes, you can make me happy. Just like you can make me angry. Just can, as you can disappoint me. Just as you can make me sad. Of course, you can make me happy. But I should not be deriving all of my happiness from you. Going to Cass's point, happiness does come from within. And what Duke is saying is there's a lot of people in, in relationships where they're not happy. And here's another one, Fine Society. I have a theory, especially in this modern dating world, so many people go from one relationship to the next relationship just so that they have somebody to blame their shit on. Mm. It's like, my life is messed up because of this other person. And then after a year, it's another person. And then after two years, it's another person. But it's always the person I'm in a relationship is messing my life up. But here's the thing, people, and this is something that I learned in my 20s, and we should all learn it for all relationships we're in, romantic or otherwise. You are the common denominator in all of your failed mm -hmm. relationship. So at some point, it's got to be you. You have to ask yourself, if you're attracting the same type of man or woman, why? What about you keeps attracting broken people? cheaters, whatever the whole thing were, right? Mm -hmm. You keep getting into relationships with these people, understanding that the previous relationship didn't work. Rob and I are in very different relationships that we were in previously with our former spouses. This is not the same relationship that I was in, in a marriage that failed. And it's not the same relationship that he was in, in a marriage that failed. That was important because that shit did not work. We realized the reason it did not work. And when we were out there looking and dating with intention, even though we kind of happened on accident, um, we were very clear. This is why going back to Duke, we rapid fired those questions. And again, the, the way we did it, it wasn't so much like we had a list of questions. It was through conversation and through conversation, very meaningful conversations, questions would arise. Would you say that that's yeah, kind of what I, happened? I would agree with that. I would definitely agree with that. And I'm just sitting over here in my head trying to formulate this point that I'm coming up with. Oh, probably. Jesus. So, so Cass is saying, why are sense. you choosing those people? That is the question. And maybe that's where therapy even comes in. Why are you choosing those same people over and over again? Or why are those people choosing you? Because there's a lot of people, again, because they will blame the other person. Well, why do these same people keep choosing you? Where when, when women say, all of the men I have are, you know, no shit men. Well, why are no shit men attracted to you? Mm -hmm. And here's what I was, the point I was trying to think of is something that made me think about a kind of a difference in how this relationship went also. Is I think traditionally, I always kind of, when I was looking at a woman or whatever, I would look at the ways that she could add to my life. You know what I'm saying? What she could do, what, how she would bring, how she would fit, how she would do all of that. And that's assuming that she actually wants to do that shit. With her, I was able to pretty quickly identify areas in her life where I would be able to help her. You know what I'm saying? Where I would be able to add value to her. And I think she said the same thing, you know? So... One, it, it set the stage of rather than looking at what I could get out of it, I was looking for what I could give to the situation. But I think that was set up purely because there was like a completed circuit is the understanding was by giving in this relationship, I get even more back, you know, and that's where the completion of the circuit comes in. That's why I'm sitting on this damn couch right now, you know, two years ago, I had zero desire to be any type of media figure. Zero. <laughs> I played ball. I did interviews. I did all that shit. I thought that shit was in my past. I don't care about that stuff. I want money. I don't want to be famous. I have no desire to be famous. But because of what she wants to do with her life, I said, yeah, let me back up off that position a little bit and help. I can help her get farther than she can get by herself and vice versa. Think of it like airplanes. We all know the old school one propeller airplane. How could an airplane with one engine outperform an airplane with two? I can't think of a you single can't. way that it can happen. You can't. That was some good points, babe. 
here is here is the thing that I think um, people have difficulties with, and I'm going to speak to the women because, as I said last week, I speak to the women, he speaks to the men, and we speak to both collectively, ladies. You can't get out of something if you don't put into it. Mm-hmm. It doesn't work that way. For my Jamaicans on the uh, on the thing, some some West Indian people call it susu, some people call it partner. I don't know what Americans call it, but you don't get out of a partner if you haven't put in. And once once you put in, you don't get to when you get your money out, just don't contribute to the partner no more. No, you have to finish it until everybody's gotten what they're supposed to get. And I think a lot of the times we are afraid of investing. Like how, why would I put my all into a man if I don't know what I'm getting back out? Nothing in life is guaranteed. I, there was nothing guaranteed when I got on that plane one year ago of what would happen. But I, 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 it, it sounds whatever, but I had to step out on faith. I had to step out on, here are two people who came together, who put everything on the table, good, bad, and indifferent, still liked it. Like we, we lit, I, you know, I put in the book, we stood in front of each other, naked scars and all. I said, okay, that's cool. We'll do this thing. That's what we did. Consider yourself standing in front of the person that you love, that you want to be with naked. And they're seeing all of your scars, everything that has happened in your life from before you met them. That's what Rob and I did. The good, the bad, the ugly, all of it. We stood there in front of each other and said, this is all of it. Right. I I think that's the only way to do it. That really is the only way to do it is you got to be willing to accept the whole person and you got to be willing to put your whole self out there. This guarantee, this wanting a, a, a set return, wanting an expected outcome, like people that think like that need to be doing safer shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't chase a basketball dream because the odds were in my favor. You feel what I'm saying? I chased that dream. Hell, my whole life been a dream, basically, because. The expected outcomes on my day of birth were not very much. Fortune your mother. You know what I'm saying? So, I come from a place they got to say, no risk it, no biscuit. If all you're looking for is an even exchange, then I maybe you should just be in a different game or something like that. You know, every relationship has inherent risk. When you put your money in the bank, there's... Risk! I know we like to think of it as an absolute. This is the finance guy, by the way. But it's not. (laughs) That bank can still fold. Yeah, you got your FDIC insurance, but what good is that going to do you? Your little $40,000 sitting in the bank. The bank folds, and you got to pay your mortgage in 10 days. You looking at arbitration. You looking at all this other stuff to recover those funds back. There's no guarantees about nothing in life. You know what I'm saying? And I don't really under... Maybe it's because I have had to play and and take lower probability chances to get somewhere. But, yeah, man, like, you can... You can go to... It's it's like Vegas, you know? Um, When they know for a fact a team is... And and again, you never know for a fact, but when 90% chances that this team is going to win you got to bet more money to make that dollar back so you got to bet like a dollar 75 to get a dollar Mm -hmm. so even that is adding risk whereas the underdog you can bet a quarter on them and come back with a dollar yo that used to be at the end of the day it's all risk so i'm a gambler And when the Seattle Supersonics became the OKC Thunder, that was one of the best bets I used to take gambling because the odds, the spread on OKC was always so bad. And I used to take it. And funny enough, I want to say 70% of the times they would cover that spread. And I would, you put $10 and all of a sudden I have 200 and something because everybody thinks they're going to get blown out and all of those things. But I've always been a person who was like, you cannot get, and like you said, you're not going to get anything out of life playing it safe. 
relationships are not safe bets. Rob may have been the best bet I've taken because when I looked at the totality of his life, I was like, damn, this is someone you bet on, right? There is a difference between looking at somebody's present and looking at the totality of their life. How many of us are looking at just someone's present? Because again, we, we are so short-sighted sometimes. All we see is what's right in front of us. When Rob told me his life story, and I'm sure when I told him mine, we looked at the totality of each of our lives. I know I definitely did in Robert's. And I said the totality of his life says to me that this is the type of man he is. The situation he's in currently don't look so great, but that's one chapter in a 40 something chapter book. Yeah, that's how I see it too. So we want to thank everyone for joining us. We've got some questions. Babe, can you just grab that bowl? Oh. Your hands are a little bit longer than yeah. mine. So we're going to do our question and answer section. If someone has any yeah, questions for us, up. nobody ever really asks us questions, but feel free to ask us questions and we will answer Thanks. them. Thanks for we're us very in transparent. My book, my book is going to be coming out in March, so y'all going to learn a lot. A lot, lot, a lot, a lot, right. a lot. Jesus we'll Christ, do a couple of these questions the and we're going to finish this up. Because um, I ain't going to lie, y'all, work kicked my ass today. Like, yeah, he was, he was stumping. And I've been as high energy as I possibly can. <laughs> Like he Lord was kicked my ass. He was, today, he was on the computer like, today. Like, okay, what's the question? All right. Could you be happy in a relationship if the sex was horrible? No. Really? Just, no. Okay. Well, I'm just going to leave it there. I'm not going to. I mean, we're together, so clearly that indicates to people that it's fire, but it's a lie. No, I don't know. No. <laughs> okay. I mean, well, maybe if it was horrible with no possibilities of improvement, maybe then I would say no. You know, I think everything can always. <laughs> it, yeah, it, like, see, Duke, Duke working, said, you know, oh, hell, hell no. no. You know? And I ain't saying we got to be going crazy every night, but it's just like when we do get into it, I'm not dealing with no spam. Mediocre, mediocrity. Okay. Vienna sausages, like, you don't. <laughs> oh my lord this is a long question um and so i'm going to go through it quickly as possible your significant other stays the night over their ex's house to spend more time with their child is this acceptable hail to the no explain why are you putting yourself in a situation where a woman thinks that she can control you well after you've left and you need to go over to her house and spend time with her child. You must That's be crazy. That's all I'm saying. Like, why you gotta spend? The, why your kid ain't spending the night at your house? Well, here's the thing. It's happened on some of these reality shows where guys were. So having the kid can't come to your house. The only way for you to have overnight is to be at her house. Especially when the, when when daddy has a new girlfriend. I kiss my whole ass. <laughs> Next question. That we're going to off a little bit. <laughs> hell, Duke that. said, oh, hell no, we can't. We're just going to do one more question to each guy so he can go because he did have a long day. Uh, when and where did you go on your first date ever? Jesus, a lot of Oh, my God. I can answer that. I, I think maybe it was like this. You know, I'm from Rochester, New York. Anybody knows about it. Back in the days, there was this little tiny rinky-dink-ass amusement park out by the lake. And I, I, I think that might have been my first date. But I'm not nostalgic on that type of So thing. my first date was going to, for the Toronto people, going to the Eaton Center Movie Theater to see Bad Boy, the original Bad Boy. I want to say this was 94 or 95. And it was going to see the original Bad Boy at the Eaton Center with my very first boyfriend. I wasn't even supposed to be dating him because I hadn't turned 16 yet. And so I had to actually lie to my mother and tell her I was going out with friends because I was just 15. I was almost 16. And so it was my first uh, boyfriend, Jason. That's where I went on my date. Yeah. Oh, Lord. I got another long one. That's how men get locked up. Like oh, this. this is a good one. This is a question for you. Okay. He was, he, well, we were Take in the same one. age group. What do you mean he's oh. going to get locked up? Okay. We're in the same no, age group. I just, I just was in 16. Okay. Tuny Tuesday and the movies. <laughs> exactly. There you go. Um, a man is dating two women. He lies to one about this and is truthful with the other woman. Which relationships does he value more? That actually question is for you. About the one that he's keeping it real with. I completely agree, which is funny because, again, in my book, I talk about briefly a relationship I was in where the best friend told the friend, you guys are too honest with each other. You clearly don't love each other. You lie to a woman when you love her. Yeah. Mm, 
Like that's one way to look at it. Um, no, nah, I just here's the thing, especially in relationships, any kind of relationship, friendship. Re- in order to lie, it's almost like you have to feel that that person is putting you in a position where the truth isn't acceptable. Mm-hmm. And I don't like letting people do that shit to me. Kat said her first date was a basement reggae party. Basement bro, reggae bro, party. Bro, bro, like bro, bro. Again, where we we no, said hit up the, the, like the furnaces. Said, I used to be in basement parties <laughs> when I was like 11, y'all. Like, that was, for real. Okay. I was like six, two already. No, kill me. Uh, one more each, and then we're done. I'm putting this bowl away. Okay. Next one. Which of us is most likely to get drunk and ruin the night? Uh, well, me. <laughs> Good she answer. Don't drink barely. <laughs> and if she, I'm imagining she's a happy drunk. I'm a sociable drunk, but if you rub me the wrong way, then it's going up. You would definitely be the one to get drunk and ruin the night. Okay, last question. Oh, my God, this is a good one. What has loving me... Oh, actually, this question is for you. What has loving me taught you about yourself? Damn. I know, right? It's a profound one for the last one. What has loving you taught me about myself? This is probably not the answer that we're looking for because it's not romantic. He's not romantic. I don't expect a romantic answer. But here's the thing. Because I love this woman, and over the last year, and because we've had certain situations really manifest, I realize more than ever how big of an asshole that I am. And I thank God that she's actually supportive of that. (laughs) There you go, ladies and gentlemen. That's what She's loving me of being an has taught oh, Rob right. about himself. Hence the show, fuck what the show. big of an asshole he is. Nine out of ten women run when I say that <laughs> shit to them. They're like, this nigga is, what is fuck your feelings. I don't want to be in a relationship where my feelings don't matter. <laughs> and she, she managed to see through the logic and, and, and get to the, the understanding. And that's why we're still rocking out, you know, so... I definitely know I'm not an easy person to get along with. I've never had the impression that I was, but being with her has pointed out more and more that I just, there's times where, I, honestly, I could be nicer. I'm just like, fuck that. Thanks. Is it because I put up with it so long? No, it's just because you honestly, you, you think you pull punches, but you don't. You there. There's not much that flies by that you want to speak on that you don't speak on. And that, that is very that's, true. That's, that's that's the thing. There's stuff that I, I'm like, it's not even worth it. But her, no. She gets like anything. It, <laughs> anything. If I drop an ice cube out the freezer. She Jesus, Lord of mercy. Oh my God, you dropped the ice cube and you just left it on the floor. You didn't pick it up. And that was a puddle of water. I'm like. Now I do go clean it up. But I yeah. still need to make a note of it that he knows that hopefully he won't drop the ice cube the next time. Yeah, but, I'll yeah. drop that shit next time too. Oh my God, love you so much. Thank you everybody for joining us. Again, we are the Fuck Your Feelings crew. We are here to change the conversation around black relationships. But before we go, we have to give a special shout out to our sponsor, Soul and Sage, who makes skin care for the sensitive soul. You can find them at shop sorrelandsage.com on their website or sorrelandsageca on Instagram. Amazing. Thank you all for joining. If you would like to be a part of the show, you would like to be a guest, you would like to um, have a topic um, that you would like us to discuss, please let us know. I think the one of the next ones, and thank you Duke for this, we are going to be talking about privacy in a relationship and what that means. So thank you, everybody. Yes, my mama beard. Uh, mama there you beard, go. Uh, he wants his beard oil yeah, again. ShopSorrelAndSage.com and, and SorrelAndSage.ca. We are looking forward to our next care package, Sorrel and Sage, because we're almost done with the ones that you have with this man. He's not itching his skin as much. Appreciate you guys. See you next week. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Peace.